All right, let's get started. Um, so last time, at the very end, I defined what a functor was and what a contravariant functor was. I'm not going <coughs> to spell out the whole thing for a contravariant functor again. It's the same thing as a functor from C up to D. And if you don't believe that, you should check or you should at least convince yourself that it's true. But I want to start this off with a bunch of examples of functors. All right, so. So for the first example, we're going to take some object x in our category C. Um, there is, is, is a functor, and this is an important one. Um, and we'll write it as Cx blank. And it goes from the category C to set. All right. So what does it do to describe a functor? We need to say what it does on objects and what it does on morphisms. So on objects, it sends an object Y in C to the set of morphisms in C from X to Y. And on morphisms, all right, so what do we need? We need to take a map, say F, from objects Y to Z. This is a map in C. And it takes us to the map F lower star, which goes from maps from X to Y in C to maps from x to z in C. All right, and so what does this do? It takes g, which is some map from x to y, to f composed with g. So diagrammatically, you start with some map from x to y, g, and then you post-compose with f to get a map like that. All right, so we should check functoriality, because this is our first example of a functor. What do I mean by functoriality? I mean we should check that it preserves composition and it preserves identities. All right, so we'll let alpha be a map from A to B, and beta be a map from B to C. OK, so what does functoriality mean in this case? Well, um, we want to show that uh, beta star composed with alpha star is equal to beta composed with alpha star. Um, so given some map from x to a, we have that beta star, alpha star applied to f is, well, first we apply alpha star, and we get that that's alpha composed with f. And then we apply beta star, and that's beta composed with alpha composed with f. And we have that beta composed with alpha, which is also a map in C. All right, star. When we apply that to f. Well, that's beta alpha composed with f. And so these are the same. All right, great. Um, so again, if you think about this diagram we had here, we have x to a. And then in this, first, in this first direction, we went, we post composed with um, alpha, and then we post composed with beta to get c. And in the second direction, we post composed just with their composition. So beta alpha. All right. All right, and
And secondly, we want to show that, and lastly, we want to show that um, this functor preserves identities. So um, for A and C, we have that um, the identity on A star applied to F is the identity of A composed with F, which is F. All right. So this is a functor. All right, another example of a functor, which is very similar to this one. Um, we also have a functor C blank X, which goes from C up to set. All right, and so now we, instead of post-composing on the morphisms, we pre-compose on the morphisms. But that means that you go from, um, from, it reverses the order. And you should check that if you don't believe me. Um, all right, more functors. There's a functor blank star, which goes from vector spaces to vector spaces, or from vector up to vector, um, which, again, on objects, what does it do? It sends a vector space to linear transformations from that vector space to the ground field. This is the dual, um, which I suspect everyone has seen before. On morphisms, um, so it takes F to V to W, and it sends them so it takes this map between vector spaces, and it sends it to f upper star. Right, so when we did this, we also switched the, the star. So it's upper star. Um, and that's from hom wk to hom vk. All right, and here we, again, we map some G to FG. So what's happening here? G is from W to K, and then we precompose with F to get this. And in fact, um, this is just a specialization of this, where the category is vector spaces, and x is the ground field. Yes? Is the convention to put the star on the top of the vector reversing the order? Yes. Yeah. So lower star means preserving, yeah. is, is covariant, and upper star is contravariant. All right. All right, the next type of functor I want to talk about is forgetful functors. Um, so that it, these are functors which forget structure. And I would actually say it's the other way around. You should define freeness as a joint to forgetful, not the other. All right. So we're going to write u from c to d. Um, and we're going to write some examples for where c and d. Let's see. Um, we can forget 
from monoids to sets so this functor takes a monoid and maps it to the underlying set and it takes a homomorphism and just forgets that it's a homomorphism but still it's still a function between those sets all right uh, we could have groups well we can also forget that to set or we can forget that it's a group but still remember that it's a monoid all right uh, we can have abelian groups and we can forget that they're abelian and just remember that they're groups or we can forget that they're groups and just remember that they're monoids or we can forget that they have a multiplication and just remember that they're a set yes um, okay so we also and and there are lots of examples like this actually I don't want to I don't want to all right, and now we're going to switch these cameras. OK, and it's switched on the screen. So OK, um, so the next example <coughs> we want to look at is, is a functor, which that should be like some sort of curly O. It's not the best. Um, which goes from the opposite of the topological category of topological spaces to the category of posets. What does it do? So on morph on on objects, it takes a topological space and it sends it to. This, the set equals, this is the set of open sets in X with partial order uh, given by inclusion. Right, so we say that um, an, an open set A is less than or equal to an open set B if, if A is contained in B. All right, and what does this do on morphisms? So we have some morphism F from X to Y between topological spaces, and it sends it to F inverse from open sets on Y to the open sets on X. All right, so because this is a, a continuous map between topological spaces, the pre-image of an open set in Y is an open set in X, because that's what continuity means. Um, and it is a map of partially ordered sets, because if if some open set A is contained in some open set B in Y, then the pre-image of A is contained in the pre-image of B. All right. Here is an important one for algebraic geometry. Um, I'm going to call it spec. And it goes from the category of commutative rings, or the opposite of the category of commutative rings, topological spaces and it sends on objects it sends a ring R to spec R which is the set of prime ideals in R with the Zariski topology. All right. And then on morphisms, you have some 
ring homomorphism from R to S. And it also sends it to the pre-image. So spec, spec S to spec R. And the important thing here is that the pre-image of a prime ideal is prime. And so it's continuous with respect to the Sariski topology. Um, OK. So I want to recall what a G set is. Recall that a G set. Sorry? I, if they don't know, it's fine. They can they can look it up. These are just lo I'm doing lots of examples. I don't people don't need to understand all of them. I, I'm yeah. The recall that a G set is a set X with a group action. So that's a map, um, which I'll call dot, from G cross X to X, uh, such that E dot, the identity times an element is the identity, and, and it's associative in that G dot H dot X is g of h dot x. All right. Also, we know that the definition of a group is that it's a one-object groupoid. So um, we can consider, I'm going to write g underline. The G, um, and this was because we could do this for monoids. It groups a monoid, and so we have a one-object category where the morphisms are the elements, and composition is multiplication in the group. All right, then a G set is a functor. from G underline to the category of sets. All right, so what is such a functor? Well, it, this is a one object group. So it picks out one set, and then the morphisms act on that set by sort of, and determine this action. Um, and that's a, this is a worthwhile thing to do as an exercise, um, is to check that this definition and this definition carry exactly the same information. <coughs> All right. We're almost through the many examples that I wanted to do before we got to the fundamental group. Um, so we previously said what a free monoid is. OK. Um, so we have a functor. I don't know why I underlined that. Um, so we have a functor from F going from set to mon, which on objects takes a set to the free monoid on X that we previously described, and on morphisms takes a map f to x, and it takes it to f tilde from fx to fy. All right. And how does it do so? Um, so previously, when we described what a free monoid is, uh, we defined it in terms of some universal property. All right, and so we have this diagram. We have a map from x to y, given by f. And then 
this is a free monoid on X came equipped with this sort of inclusion um, function. And similarly, we had the same thing for f of y. Um, but that means that we have a map from x to this monoid. And so by the universal property of the free monoid on x, we have a map here. All right. Um, I should say that this diagram works similarly for the other things that we defined this way, right? Um, so I also said that we can draw the same universal property for like the free group and the, the free, I don't know, whatever else I said we could do freely. Um, and so you can do this same free construction. Uh, sorry, you can, you can show that that free construction is functorial in those other cases in exactly the same way, using the universal property. Yes? Intuitively, like it's a bit weird to just sort of combining it on the generator is gonna be over right? Yes, intuitively you should think about this as doing things on the generators. And I'm repeating what you said rather than just saying yes, because people's questions don't show up in the recording. Um, all right, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, so I described two categories before. One of them was like this, and I called it the walking arrow. And one of them was like this, and I called it the walking isomorphism. So a functor from, OK, let's, let's call this A, and let's call this B. A, a functor from A to C chooses an arrow or a morphism in C. And a functor from B to C chooses an isomorphism in C. That's, that's all the information it contains. It chooses a functor from here, chooses two objects and an arrow between them. A functor from here chooses two objects and an isomorphism between them. All right. Yes? Yeah. It just is a morphism. All right. So. And here's a dumb little proof, or a dumb little lemma. Functors preserve isomorphisms. And the proof is that if I have a pair of isomorphisms, if I have a pair that are, that are inverse to each other, f and g, then by functoriality, f of g composed with f of f is f of g composed with f. There are isomorphisms in the source category, so that's f of the identity, but then that's just the identity by functoriality. And you can do that with these on either side. All right. Um, so, okay, I'm going to switch back to that side because we're going to be talking about this for a while. Oh. Okay, just hang there then. Um, all right. So, I will still leave up our definition of functor. And now we get to some a detour through some algebraic topology. Um, Sorry. 
things. A path in a topological space is a map from the interval, so the interval 0 to 1 with the Euclidean topology on it, from i into x. Um, paths f and g are um, let's say paths f and g such that f of 0 equals g of 0 and f of 1 equals g of 1, so that is they start and finish in the same place, are path homotopic if there exists, all right, and a map f at h from the interval, from the product of the interval with itself into x such that h t of 0 equals f, h t of 1 equals g, and h 0 of s equals f of 0, and h 0 of uh, h 1 of s equals f of 1. All right, so what is such a thing? Let's, if I have some topological space, x, and let's say x is the area contained between these two curves. So if I have a path f, this is some map from the interval to x like this. Maybe I have some other path g. And let's have some third path h. OK. So these two conditions, so my, my, this map is a map in from a square. This condition says that on one edge of the square is mapped to where f is mapped to. This condition says that the other, the opposite side is mapped to where g is mapped to. This condition says that this whole side gets mapped to this point. And this last condition says that the opposite whole side gets mapped to this point. All right, so what does this look like? Well. This is a map of topological spaces, which means that it has to be continuous. Um, so I'm not going to, like, either it is a map of topological space or it's not. Um, all right, so what does it look like for, to have such a homotopy from f to g? Well, you can think of it as being continuous in the slices parallel to, to the sides of the square. So it looks like a movie that moves through the space between f and g and continuously deforms f into g. All right. Now, this would be hard to prove just with the, with the tools currently at our disposal, but f and g are homotopic, but g is not homotopic to h. There's no way to continuously map this square with these conditions into the space that we have here so that g continuously deforms into h without tearing, basically. All right, so, um, so something to note is we write, we write that f is homotopic to g. Um, and it's important to know that homotopy of paths is an equivalence relation. All right, so we, we can. Can 
catenite paths. Uh, so we'll say paths f and g if f of 1 equals g of 0. So that is, we can stack two paths together if one of them finishes where the other one starts. All right, and so we'd write f dot g is, um, so this is a map from the interval to x that does what? All right, it takes t in the interval, and it sends it to f of 2t if t is in the first half of the interval, and it sends it to g of 2t minus 1 if t is in the second half of the interval. That is, it's do f and then do g, but because we are writing our paths as maps from the interval, we have to do it at double speed on both of them. OK. Um, so we know that f concatenated with g concatenated with h is not the same as f concatenated with g concatenated with h. Because in this first case, we're doing these two at quadruple speed and this one at half speed. And in this case, we're doing this one at half speed and these two at quadruple speed. So they are not the same map from the interval to x. However, however, we do have that they are path homotopic. OK. Um, and because I said that um, this is an equivalence relation, I'm in fact going to write it like this to indicate that these are equivalence classes of homotopic maps. OK. So a loop. in X is a path in X such that f of 0 equals f of 1. So it's a path that starts and finishes in the same spot. All right. And now I'm going to define a functor. from which we'll call pi 1 from the category of pointed topological sets to group so what do we have to say? We have to say what it does on objects so with Pi 1 of x. So, OK, so this is in the category of pointed topological spaces, which actually means that to specify an object, we need to specify a topological space and a, and a base point. So I'm going to call that base point x0. So this is the homotopy classes. of loops in X based at X naught. So what I mean here, I mean that we call where the path starts and ends the base of the, the, the base of where the loop is based. And so this has to be equal to X zero. 
<coughs> okay. Now, it's clear that this thing is a set. Maybe not so obvious that it's a group. Um, so the, this is called the fundamental group. Um, of x, or of x based at x naught. Um, and the, at, for this to be a group, the multiplication is concatenation, concatenation of loops. So because they all start and end at the same spot, you can just keep concatenating them. Um, the identity is the constant loop, which is the loop that sends the whole of the interval into the base point. And the inverse of some loop f, which we will annoyingly write as f inverse, although you might also see it as f overline, which is probably less confusing, um, is a map from the interval into the space, which does the, the loop backwards. So t goes to f of 1 minus t. All right. And showing that this is a group requires some things. For instance, it requires that concatenation respects um, Homotopy, it requires showing that this actually is an inverse, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all right. So I've said that this is a functor, and I've only described the construction. I need to say what it does on maps. So given a map in the category of pointed topological spaces, so we're going from x, x naught to y, y naught which is a continuous map from x to y that sends x naught to y naught. All right, what does this go to? This goes to, well, it goes to f lower star from pi 1 of x, x naught to pi 1 of y, y naught. And it takes. a map from the uh, uh, homotopy class in here is represented by some loop into x. And it takes that to the loop in y represented by post-composing with f. Uh, so this is OK. Um, so this, in fact, looks a lot like this, what, the first example that we did of a functor. Um, it's, it's almost that, uh, except that this is a group of equivalent classes and not just a set of functions. <coughs> All right. Now I need to switch. Cameras. All right, so that's the fundamental group. The first 40% of the algebraic topology course here is about it. Um, there's lots of interesting things that can be done. Uh, the calculations of of Fundamental groups and of homotope, of higher dimensional homotopy groups is hard. Uh, all the definitions are easy. And that's why we have homology, which we'll get to at some point, which is harder to define but easier to do. All right. Now, a related um, functor to this one is the following. Um, I'm going to call it 
big pi 1, which goes from the category of topological spaces, unpointed now, and it goes to the category of groupoids. Um, so, I don't know if I've actually said this at any point. I'm going to say this a, a little in, in a little bit, but actually now that we have functors, we have a notion of morphisms between categories. Uh, so this is the category that contains all the groupoids, and the maps between them are functors. Um, that's a little bit annoying, because the category of groupoids is not a small category. Uh, and in particular, the, um, the, the, the HOM sets are not sets here. There are too many functors in this category. Um, but we'll ignore that for now, because it's, it's not that important to what we're talking about. So big pi 1 of x is the groupoid. So this is a category who, with, with, OK, it has objects, and those objects are elements of the topological spaces. So points in the topological space. And the morphisms are homotopy classes of paths between two points. So a map from x to y, a morphism from x to y in this category is a homotopy class of paths. All right. Um, and I guess, so I would say, really I should say like path homotopy classes, because what we've just defined here is a path homotopy. Um, in, in general, a homotopy doesn't like have these two requirements on it. Um, but if you don't have those, then there's like only one thing in any path component, path component of, a, of, a, of the topological space. And it's kind of boring. All right. So this is a functor. I've only told you what it does on objects, right? Which is this. So I need, you to, need to tell you what it does on a morphism. So we have some morphism, some continuous map between topological spaces. Um, and this needs to be a map between groupoids, which is a functor. So this is a functor. And what does it do? So this goes from, oh, why have I written F here? This goes from the fundamental groupoid of x to the fundamental groupoid of y. And to be a function, I need to tell you what it does on objects. So on objects, well, it sends x to f of x. And on morphisms, it sends some homotopy class of paths from x1 to x2 to the homotopy class uh, f of g from f of x1 to f of x2. So. This is the fundamental groupoid. Uh, and lots of things that you prove and do with, with um, fundamental groups, you can make similar statements in the fundamental groupoid and some proofs are nicer in here than they are in, in the other case, but just they require more machinery. <coughs> and it may be a little bit less intuitive. OK. Um, 
Now let's see an example of functoriality being useful with sort of the go-to first use, the first, first theorem that you prove once you've managed to calculate something with, with homotopy groups. So I'm going to do the, now I'm going to need to know how to spell this. Brower fixed point theorem, <coughs> which I have written an excellent poem about, but I do not have it here. Um, all right, so, and we're only going to do the two dimensional case. So, um, any map from the two disk to itself <coughs> in top, which I'm writing instead of writing continuous, has a fixed point. This is, this is a very fun proof. Um, and I should keep some colors on me. All right, so proof. All right. Uh, suppose, and we'll call this map F, suppose that we have such a map for which this is false. So we have such a map such that f of x is not equal to x <coughs> for all points in the two-disc. All right. Then we can construct a map uh, from d2 to its boundary. Um, up as follows. So we have the boundary of D2. Inside this is the disk. And if you pick a point, X, it gets mapped to somewhere that is not where it started. So I'm going to call this F of X. And then we have this point on the boundary, which I'm going to call r of x. So this is defining our function now, which is determined uniquely by passing a ray from where x ends up through where it started to the boundary. All right. Um, that such a thing is continuous sort of boils down to if you wiggle x around a little bit, f only wiggles around a little bit because it's continuous, and so r only wiggles around a little bit. Um, all right, so notice notice that for x in the boundary of the two disk, which is s1, r of x equals x. So we have the boundary, which we can include into the two disk. And then we can map back to the boundary by r. This actually is the identity on S1, this composition. All right, but by functoriality, That means that pi 1 of s1, so we'll call this i. OK, so we have some i lower star. This goes to pi 1 of d2, which goes via r star to pi 1 of s1. All right, well, the identity is preserved under functoriality, so this is the identity on pi 1 of s1. Um, 
I sort of left off that there's a boundary, that there's, I should, this should be in pointed topological spaces. We just have the base points in the same spot. Um, now, not something I'm going to go through, through, but pi 1 of S1, which is the circle, this is Z. This is a copy of the integers. Pi 1 of the disk is 0 because if you take any loop in here in the disk, you can pull it back through the loop to that point. So this is also 0, uh, Z. However, there is the identity on the integers in the category of groups does not factor through the zero through zero, and so therefore this is a contradiction. Hence, we cannot have had the map that we started with. All right, and proving something like this is possible without using um, algebraic topology, but it's much more annoying. All right. So that's sort of the, the first example you usually see of functoriality being useful. Um, yes? <coughs> I don't know what that means. Um, maybe, but I don't know how you would, how you would do this. You, yeah, you, you would have to do it differently in that case. Um, so oh, also, like intuitively, it's not that hard to, to understand why pi 1 of s1 is, is z. You just, um, for each integer, you pick a direction. And then for each integer, you say, well, 1 is the loop that goes around once and ends there. 2 is the loop that goes around twice and ends here. Negative 1 is going in the other direction. Um, and however many, you want to say that however many times you sort of squiggle, if you pull it tight, it becomes one of the, it's homotopic to one of those. Um, it's a fair amount of work to show that. All right. And now I'm going to go back to the other side. And now we're going to see simplicial things, which are very important in algebraic topology, although they don't show up in the um, standard algebraic topology class. Um, they come up later, and I think I can get rid of this. I think everyone's satisfied with how, with what a, with what a function, what a functor is. All right. I'm just going to clean all of these. What time is it? Now we can go a bit longer. Ooh. Yeah. All right, so the simplex category. Oh, am I? Yeah. The simplex category. All right, which we will call delta, has the following objects. It has its object set n with a total order on them. And for all natural numbers, as I said, we include zero as a natural number because we are not heathens. Um, and then for morphisms, we want, OK, so we want maps between these totally ordered sets. So we'll map from M to N is uh, a weakly order preserving. All right, so what does that mean? That means that 
if i is less than j, then f of i is less than or equal to f of j. All right. Delta has um, two. Let's put two. Give me something number. Two important sets of morphisms. All right, and the these are the coface maps. All right, so these are maps, and I'm going to index them like this, D I N, which go from N minus 1. Also, there are a lot of indices in what follows, and there's like a non-zero chance that I will fuck up the indices at some point. Um, to N, sending K. So this is actually a function of, of ordered sets now. It sends K to itself if K is less than I. And it sends it to K plus 1 if K is greater than or equal to I. So this is. Skip i. So it goes from a set of cardinality n plus one n to a set of cardinality n plus one by sending every element to itself up until it gets to i, and then it skips i and then keeps going. Um, so skip i, and uh, we have one of these maps for all for for each n we have. Um, maps of this form for i from 0 to n, inclusive. Um, all right, and then next we need co-degeneracy de maps. All right, and these we'll call s, and we'll index them in i as well. And now instead they go in the opposite direction. So from n plus 1 to n, and it sends k to, OK, so now we're going like to something smaller. So we're going to go to k if k is less than or equal to i, and to k minus 1 if k is greater than i. So this is double on i. So we hit the ith element twice. All right. Now, uh, it's mildly annoying. All right. I'll just get it here. <coughs> Proposition. These satisfy the what we'll call the co simplicial identities. All right. These are that. J, the I is equal to the I dj minus one for I less than J. We have S J S I equals S I minus one S J. Or I greater than J, we have S J D I 
So this, this goes up to, this one goes down to, and this one goes up and then down. So it ends up in the same spot. Um, and these are D, I, S, J minus 1 for uh, I less than J. This is the identity for I equal to J or J plus 1. And this is D, I minus 1 S, J for i greater than j plus 1. All right, so I've left out the, subscri the, the subscripts here. I've left out these n's. Uh, it's sort of, it's implicit what the correct subscript should be at any point. Um, so further, any map f from m to n factors uniquely as, all right, we want f equals d i1 up to d i k and s j 1 up to s j, I guess h, such that m minus h plus k equals n, and the following, we have the following orderings. So 0 is less than or equal to j1, which is less than up to j h, which is less than m, this is an h. And then 0 is less than i k up to i1, which is less than n. All right, so the reason these are important is because they describe all of the maps in the, in the or any map in this category can be factored as these. Um, if factors in this specific way, um, you sort of can verify these identities directly. Uh, and then, okay, this is a, no, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna put up the sketch. Um, the point is that if the image of this is equal to p, then this section here, like if the image of the image of this of of f is less than or equal to what you started with, like the the size of it. So if if the image has size <coughs> p, then this pushes you down to the set p, ordering everything correctly, and then this pushes you back up to wherever you're supposed to end up, wherever n is. Um, so this is squish down to size, and this is putting in the gaps. All right, so <coughs> what I've written down here about this is the delta category, the simplex category is important. There are good categorical reasons for this. It contains a universal monoid. I probably won't get the chance to talk about what that means, but if you're interested, it's on McLean page 171. So. Um, I 
think that might be on my in my copy of Maclean, which is first edition, and um, and uh, so it will be slightly different for the second edition, which is the one you want to be reading. Um, all right, let's switch cameras again. Oh, it was too slow this time. Um, Okay, actually, maybe this is a good place to take a break. <laughs>